disruptors and curious minds, CEOs, founders, book lovers. It's that time of the week again. I'm Mark, this is Jeremy, and you're listening to the Thinking on Paper Book Club, where we explore the insight, strategy, and ideas of books that have stood the test of time, books that will change your mind and make you better in your job, in your home, in your relationships, in your sporting endeavors, whatever it is you choose. Books like Clear Thinking by Shane Parrish, brilliant. Books like The Design of Everyday Things by Don Norman, former guest, by the way. And books, because we're in quantum season two, like this month's Quantum Supremacy by Michu Kaku, which Jeremy chose. It was a great inspired choice. Today, we're going to be talking about the different types of quantum computers, because not every quantum computer is born the same, is it, Jeremy? That's a fact. That's a fact. This this uh, chapter five, the race is on. So this is this is pretty cool. I've got to get my notes because there's so much going on here. I need my notes. Yeah, absolutely. And I've I've got mine plastered over here as well. It's uh, th- this is this is really cool. He, he, uh, the author kind of bounces from like these scene setting chapters, like we were talking about a second ago in in our little pre pro chat, to like these very descriptive like here are the nuts and bolts of what's happening. So we're transitioning kind of from a bit of a scene setter chapter into chapter five with which is nuts and bolts and then chapter six i think which we'll touch into as well is a little bit more of another scene setter so let's get down to like the nuts and bolts of like quantum so when 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 i, I bet a lot of people think about quantum and i used to before i dug into it like quantum computer i picture this like giant gold chandelier that's living in sub-zero temperatures and at the very bottom of that chandelier, there's like a tiny little square box. And that is the quantum computer. The rest of it is just this thing that that creates the proper conditions for- That's artific- because that makes a good photo for the cover of Time magazine. You have that chandelier, which I always feel like if you, if you just touched it, it would just- Just crumple, just crumple. Yeah, someone would get really mad if you touched it and your finger would probably freeze or something weird. Um, but no, the, the interesting thing, the important thing to think about, like what we're trying to harness, not we, but what quantum computing, the industry is trying to harness is the innate capabilities of quantum physics. And I think that's, that's an important thing to, to think about when we think about quantum computers. So there are multiple ways to harness or try to harness the power of quantum physics or quantum mechanics, right? So multiple architectures could satisfy this right so let's talk about superconducting first right so this is the first one that he goes into that's that's kind of our bridge from old to new because it essentially uses on off the shelf components like how we build computers today just doing it in a different way by basically cooling down these components to as close to absolute zero as possible to basically make the circuits quantum mechanical is that how you read it like super superconducting is that superconducting so well um just to pre fix that with a a sentence from the beginning that basically any quantum system that can superimpose states of zeros and ones and entangle them so that they can process this information can become a quantum computer so yeah the first one superconducting quantum which builds on something you say quite a lot jeremy and that's building on existing systems and this superconducting computing, quantum computing. It's no surprise that um, this is the method that Google that use, IBM use, the big guns are using it. Um, yeah, you have this, you have to freeze it, get it down to near absolute zero, um, which makes it very expensive and difficult to change. One of the positives of superconducting quantum computers, they become coherent. Um, quite easily so you, because it's so cold the the superposition of electrons is undisturbed um they bring in, yeah so so coherence so we talk about coherence right or coherence time is the measurement right and it goes back to vibes you hippie kids it goes back to vibes basically atoms right on together <laughs> right there you go uh atoms vibrating together in the same frequency so they're locked into this you know this together state this entanglement right um so the coherence time is actually pretty good i think or supposed to be pretty good for um for this particular style of computer right quantum computer um 
but there's still errors, right? We're still dealing yeah. with errors because it's really difficult to get to absolute zero. And some of the solution solutions that they put forth for errors, and this this brings me back to my time in the data center industry, because it's all like everything from the electrical systems, the mechanical systems, the the networks, the, all of those things have redundancy structures, whether it's what they call N plus one or 2N okay. or 2N plus one, like these different frameworks of redundancies. But the solution for for the error is at least in the um, in the superconducting version of quantum computing is redundancy. So some say though, Mark, the proper redundancy for this would be a thousand to one qubit. So for every qubit you have, you need to have a thousand qubits in a pattern to support redundancy, which sounds astronomically expensive given the fact that we're just pushing the boundaries in the hundreds of qubits, at least right now, right? So essentially to error correct. So if you have one qubit, it's going to make errors. But if you have a thousand qubits to back that up, then you can't, that they you, that thousand to one ratio to correct errors, um, all because it's impossible to get to absolute zero. So that's, is this why there are six different types in, of quantum computing in this book because obviously not everyone has the resources of IBM and Google to throw at this not everyone has the best minds to create these environments where it's near absolute zero um yeah and, two. And, and well also and then I think scale is 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 pretty good scale, is yes. pretty good in this one right because it's all off the shelf components it's stuff that we're already used to dealing with we're just creating these this astronomical cooling system around it to to basically turn traditional um into quantum so yeah, yeah yeah okay well moving on to number two the ion trap quantum computer here is an image of <laughs> trapped ions <laughs> quantum computerizing um this one was kind of we, we mentioned this i think in last week's book club thinking on paper xyz check it out um about Yet another contender is the ion trap quantum computer. When you take an electrical, electrically neutron atom and strip of some electrons, you get a positively charged ion. An ion can be suspended in a trap consisting of a series of electric and magnetic fields. And when multiple ions are introduced, they vibrate as coherent qubits. Okay, so essentially using magnetic and electrical fields to hold these in place to remove some of the decoherence and then blasting light particles at it as on off switches in a traditional silicon chip or something like that. Yeah. So these laser beams hit these, hit these ions that are, that are basically corralled. I picture like a little, I picture like a little dude with a lasso, like roll, yeah. like throwing the lasso around these ions and like you guys, Hey, hang here and, and you guys spin together and you guys spin together. And then we're going to fire a light at you and we're going to use you to compute stuff. Like it's uh, it, it part of this, like, as I read it, I understand it and I, and I get it, but I'm also like, what the hell dude? Like, I'm yeah, who like, came up with that? <laughs> it's also like, what is what is going on? But again, reminding everybody that where they're headed for this is instead of having a one and a zero, you have infinite possibilities to compute between the one and zero, right? So you're basically yes. generating compute potential between the probability states between one and zero. So that's that's where they're all getting with this. Um, but again, so some of the downsides, it looks like scaling is a pretty big challenge, right? How to how to scale this stuff because whenever we figure out something cool as humans we've got to figure out how to get it to the masses right that's how the business world works that's how adoption works and all of that kind of stuff right well you um, have to they have to readjust the fields every time they add qubits everything needs to be readjusted um on a positive note because the fields can absorb the random motion um coherence time can be larger so it can operate at higher temperatures. So you don't need this absolute zero to make it work. But then every time you add a qubit, you have to change. You have to change who the lasso, lasso is corralling these ions. Yeah, so a new, new qubit rolls in. Like, who let this yes, asshole into the party? We got to, like, we got to reset everybody. Um, there you go. No, it's it's really interesting. So, all right, so ion trap. Um, what else? I think, so this is a near vacuum state too, right? So we need to think about this is the condition that... This requires a near vacuum state to to have all of this wonderful magic happen. So ion trap, there you go. Okay. Moving, 
Moving on, we have Photonic next, right? Pho photonic quantum computers, which this is what we spoke about, I think, or we alluded to last week. We didn't really speak about it because we don't understand what's happening. But um, the Chinese enter the fray with their photonic um, quantum computers in, when was it, 2020-something? The Chinese announced that they broke an even larger barrier, performing a calculation in 200 seconds that would take a digital computer half a billion years to calculate. And they did that with a photonic quantum computer. That's that's mind boggling, man. So that, that talks about like the 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 difference in power, right, of of what quantum computing could potentially do. Right. We're everyone's still figuring it out. But like you got a race, right? You got a race. You got a quantum computer and you got a traditional computer and the differential 500 million years versus 200 seconds like that's crazy, man. That's crazy. That that's like a problem that like a cyanobacteria put out in the world that still hasn't been fixed at this point, right? Like that's the <laughs> that's the length of time that we're talking about. All right. So let's break it down like so yeah. as I understand it, the the first thing I thought of when I thought of like polarized states of light, right? My I, I, early on I went on this uh my my parents took my brother and I on this trip uh, to Hawaii. We were super fortunate that, you know, we had the ability, my parents had the wherewithal to get us on a plane and go visit Hawaii when I was younger. And it was awesome. Cool. And it was beautiful. And we ran across this, this like, uh, sunglass hut or something out there. And the sunglasses called Maui gyms. And, um, this was right when they first came out. Um, this is like the eighties, like mid to late eighties. And they had, they were one of the first companies to have polarized lenses. And everyone, my mom and dad were like, oh, this is amazing. They polarized. So they both bought a pair. And I'm like, oh, I want a pair. And they're like $150 glasses in 1988. I'm not getting them as a, you know, a 13 year old. But when you flipped, like when you looked at them like this and you looked at them flipped, light appeared different through the glass. And, and that's what I immediately start thinking about is like what a polarized state is. So it shows that light has these two potentials these two different directions that it vibrates, creating multiple paths for shit to happen is how I got my head around this. Yeah, this is like those experiments where you shine a, a, a single light beam through a slit and then it kind of creates a pattern on the other side of it that's it shouldn't do. So it kind of the superposition is in two places at the same time kind of thing. How was Pipeline back in the 80s? Did you hit it, by the way, when you were in Hawaii? No, I wasn't a surfer back then, man. I wasn't. A, I wish I was. I wish I was. Um, um, let me just read. The photonic quantum computer exploits the fact that light can vibrate in different directions. That is, in polarized states, what you were alluding to. For example, a light beam may be vibrating vertically up and down or perhaps sideways left and right. Um, so the number zero or one can be re represented by light vibrating in different polarized directions. Yep. So think about so think about this. Like when I was reading through this, I'm picturing just a a a, a mess of a tabletop with like laser beams, beam splitters, mirrors, like all all set up across this table. Right? It's a it's a mess. It's a bunch of shit on a tabletop, and basically the laser beam fires at the beam splitter, you know, half forward, half sideways, and then they hit that you know these these two things the two beams come out and they come back together using two polished mirrors and that's how the the i guess the 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 photons become entangled right um it's all about how do you get how do you get these things entangled right and then how do you keep them in that you know state of coherence so you could do something with them right so you get the lasso around them they're lassoed they're working together how do we compute on that while conditions are right yeah um, a lot, yeah. of, a lot of positives, a lot of advantages to the photonic quantum computers. Um, photon particles, unlike electrons, are not charged, so there's less um, disturbance. They're faster. You can operate at room temperature for the same reasons. And um, I'm going to try and get Zachary Vernon of Xanadu on the show, Jeremy. We need to get yes. him on because there's a Canadian company called Xanadu that have already used this photonic, quant uh, photonic quantum computers eight qubits i think they've made so far so we should get them on well what's interesting about them is they've taken the messy tabletop and put it on a chip 
Yeah. So that is, that's super interesting to me. And I think uh, this, you know, the, the, a lot of people are kind of betting on this photonic uh, quantum computing uh, methodology. So uh, it'd be interesting to talk with them and see what they're doing. Yeah, it'll be, it'll be interesting to see over the coming years who, I mean, here we're talking about six different types of quantum computing. I imagine it will kind of percolate down to one or two. And it'll be interesting to see, I assume, probably that this one will will become a, just because of the fact that you can use it at, at room temperature, will become one of the more perhaps dominant varieties. And I'm yeah, saying that with absolutely zero knowledge. <laughs> so. Well, you know, quantum computing experts and manufacturers <laughs> out there, nature is still kicking your ass. Right. It's yeah. something to really, and I think they know this. I'm not insulting you guys. You are very, you're far more intelligent about the subject than I am, but I always find it really interesting that the highest level of technology is trying to figure out how nature does a specific thing. Um, you know, and, and we get, we'll get into that in, in other chapters related to nitrogen fixing and photosynthesis and all that. Photosynthesis. Kind of We're back on photosynthesis again. Um, number four is the silicon photonic computer. What's the difference, Jeremy, between the photonic quantum computer and the silicon photonic? I, I couldn't really. I had trouble with this one too. Um, and I think the, the one point that stood out to me as he explained it is taking advantage of the dual nature of silicon. So with silicon, you can, you can use it to control the flow of electrons in transistors, which we already do in computers. But uh, allegedly, apparently, you can also use it to transmit light, right? So, so this, this ability to have, you know, light, be a medium for light transfer, flow of electrons, the whole, the whole nine yards, I think taking this dual nature of silicon is, is like the, the secret sauce, I think, to silicon photonic. Okay. Um, another guess we need to get on the the Psi com the Psi Quantum Company that um, they are tired of this small increments. They want to make a million qubit computer using this, and that that's kind of answering the problem that you mentioned earlier about having this thousand to one qubit ratio to error correct. And if they can make a quantum computer using this method, that's a million qubits then you can dial that down, have however many thousand qubits, you have all these other qubits to error correct for it. Um, It'd be interesting. Yeah, I think I think there's a lot of folks in this book that we'll, we'll be reaching out to because yep. uh, it, uh, the author references a lot of them and it'd be, they'd be great guests uh, for us. But here's something I think about too with like the, 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 the press for the, uh, the most qubits versus making the actual qubit really, really good, right? And I yeah. think there, there are a couple of folks that are like, how do we make one qubit really, really awesome versus, you know, how do we, how do we make the biggest or the, the largest collection of qubits? That's a very, very, very American thing to do to be like, hey, we got to have the most, you know, we got to have the, the, the most stuff, right? So we're going to do that or are we going to like make this one thing really, really good? So Interesting well, that's to what, track. Um, Jason Lynch of Equal One was saying, wasn't it, when we had him on the show, he was talking about that imperfect qubit versus the perfect qubit. And maybe you can, you have to decide which one, which one you want. Great reminder. Um, yeah. Yeah. What? So, uh, all right. So topological, is that where we're? Topological. We're... Yes. Topological quantum computers. Um, enter Microsoft. This is the type of quantum preferred by Microsoft, or at least it was when this book was written in 2023. I haven't actually checked if Microsoft is still using this. So if Microsoft, Bill, if you're watching. Yeah, jump on the show, talk to us about it. Um, topological, um, yeah. I, I, I was confused with topography, which is not the same thing, I don't think, the, the lay of the land. Oh, right. Yeah. It's definitely not, it's definitely not the old maps that used to build out of clay where the mountains were and like, you know, the oceans. No, it's so, so they talk about something called special topological properties, right? And yeah. uh, apparently in, in a lab, a, you know, a group of researchers, scientists came up with something called the Marjorana zero mode quasi particle. And it's this, it's this magic material that you know, allegedly was able to do quantum mechanical things at room temperature. Everyone freaked out. They're like, no way, dude. Like, what's this about? Like, what are we doing? So they tried to replicate uh, the conditions of the experiment. They weren't able to replicate this, 
you know, this magical material. So quasi, 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 quasi particle. Yeah. They call it. Yeah. Quasi. Yeah. Quasi particle. So then there was something referenced called uh, anions, you know, anions could potentially be this magic material, but I think they're still, they're still trying to figure that out. That's, that's, a, did you get the, like the rope with a knot analogy in this one? I, I kind of not, understood not it. At, not at first, because at first I think, why don't you just untie the rope, untie the knot? And then, <laughs> but then, once I'd removed that from the thought experiment, I didn't think it was the best analogy, but, um, help me with that. Cause I didn't really understand it. Well, if you have a rope with a knot in the middle, if you don't untie the knot, how do you get the knot off the rope? You can't, unless you cut the rope. Um, but hold on. so does that mean, so does that mean that the properties of something create constraints on what can be done with that thing? Yeah, similarly, physicists have tried to find physical systems that preserve the topology of the system no matter what the temperature. Um, how does that relate to the rope knot? Don't know. Yeah, lost me on it as well. I didn't really understand it at all. Michio, uh, we, we need your help on this one. We need you to jump into the next uh, episode and help us with the rope analogy. Otherwise, this this explanation of, of the types of quantum computers was actually pretty accessible. Um, yep. we have, we have one more. I think this is, this is one that a lot of people have potentially heard of. Um, well, it's actually na named after the company. The company is called D wave, isn't it? So the type of technology is like what it's quantum annealing, right? Is, is this particular technology and D wave is the company. Hey, if you have 10 to 15 million bucks, Mark, you can buy one just like another Canadian things. company as well. Like the other one, the, the other one, um, Xanadu was Canadian. C Canada seems to be leading the way in quantum for some reason we should we should meet in uh meet in toronto and like have a bunch of these folks come in together and uh yeah. you know have hash it out what is it about the water in canada that uh breeds all these quantum companies um sorry i interrupted you yeah d-wave yeah five million um lockheed martin have got one volkswagen um, japan's nec nasa have a d-wave computer although i did actually read a headline the other day that volkswagen only have a couple of years left to kind of turn around their their poor sales otherwise they're going to go out of business so maybe they've been spending too much time on quantum and not enough time building cars Ooh, facts wow <laughs> shots fired volkswagen <laughs> um so what what do you wave you know or, or at least as uh michio kaku uh talks about is that really good at, at optimization which is a why a lot of these a lot of these businesses are trying to figure out how to optimize these very interdependent data streams, work streams, work processes, right? To, to get to the nuggets of what can help them get better at, at that stuff. So um, I didn't really under, it didn't really explain what quantum no. healing was though. And it didn't really explain how they can be optimized and how they're different to other quantum computers so alan baratz uh, ceo of d-wave if you're listening come and explain how d-wave is different to we, the other five we want to understand quantum annealing for sure um <laughs> point, so pointing pointing back to the uh to the photonic version of this another i think like you said in the ion trap you know if a new qubit gets introduced you have to basically reset the whole process right and similarly yeah. on the photonic side these these computers are built to answer one question specifically right or and or make to it a solve, good question make it a really good question right because yeah. how long does it take to put all those freaking lasers on the table and like make sure all the shit's right and then yeah be sure you have the really good question but the art of inquiry is our superpower mr fielding the art of inquiry is a human superpower moving on um moving on yes um, sorry yes uh, we're moving on what does it all mean okay it doesn't let's just okay we've built a quantum computer it doesn't matter if it's ionic or it's d-wave or it's regular just good old-fashioned ibm quantum computer what are you going to do with it and that's i think now finally in part two of the book is what michio is going to get into now he's kind of explained what quantum is what the different computers are what good is it for um and actually what you just said about it can solve one calculation one let's call it one question at a time then yeah you have to make it a damn good question don't you you can't no half measures here you know let's 
use this technology to answer or to fix the world's ills, so to speak. Um, should we have a quick look into the origin of life? Let's do it. Yeah, let's run through this. The origin of life, chapter six. Just it's so, a short, it's a short conversation, the origin of life. We'll just, <laughs> just do it a couple of minutes. Too. Yeah, no, they, I, yeah, it's just an easy, easy fix, right? Um, I think the, the main things that I got out of this that he's been reinforcing through previous chapters, and we get into more detail in the upcoming chapters, is digital computers are are relatively useless to understand the really difficult biological and chemical processes that are the secret of life, right? Yeah. Is 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 what he was getting around. He talks about you know Stanley Miller back in the day that basically electrocute electrocuted a jar of goo to <laughs> simulate the start of life, right? And what he found in the jar of goo was like, holy shit, there are amino acids in here. Maybe this is how it all this is how it all began. But like, in order to create amino acids and not to get too chemical, I'm not, I'm not a chemical guy, right? I'm not a chemical engineer or anything, but there, there's a certain amount of energy necessary to break the bonds of molecules to turn them into something else. And you know, we can sit around and guess what that energy might be, or we could point a quantum computer to figure out what it is exactly. So I'm starting to kind of get my head around where where this might where this might lead. Well, yeah, as Ling Hao Zhu at Virginia Tech said, the atoms are quantum, the computer is quantum. We're using quantum to simulate quantum. So yeah, we're using the quantum to explain the quantum. I you, you don't really think about how unbelievably insanely difficult it is. I mean, they're talking about you know, amoebas essentially kind of knowing what an amoeba is and that it, it, this kind of quantum chemistry and quantum biology using this power to understand the origin of life. Well, and keep in mind, as we talk about quantum as all, you know, as it sounds so freaking magical, it, 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 Michio Kaku points to the fact that, you know, the th quantum theory is one of the most successfully proven theories of all time. And I want to keep coming back to that rooted in science and data and all of this stuff right so we're talking about magic but it's actually proven by science which is like science and magic really interesting but something so he strings a great series of steps in here um starting with schrodinger's what is life you know he wrote that about you know life is a byproduct of quantum mechanics and the blueprint of it lives in a molecule somewhere right so uh, hey that's great interesting theory Again, Schrodinger, Schrodinger's cat. We talked about that before, you know, brilliant scientist. That moves into, you know, Watson and Crick and DNA. And like everyone, th you know, th this is interesting. I, we were talking about this before. I was reading a book called The Gene, which, you know, ta talks about all aspects of, you know, the genome, genes, you know, what people do with it and all of that. But it's where I first learned about Rosalind Franklin, who actually took the x ray crystallography image of DNA that supported Watson and Crick's work. And you don't hear a lot about Franklin, but um, you know, not to get too far into the weeds of, of X-ray crystallography, but what, what that does is allows you to document things that are really, really freaking small because X-ray wavelengths are the size of atoms, right? So you can get really small. And uh, I actually saw a picture of it. You can look it up, the picture of DNA X-ray crystallography. It's like, holy shit, that's, that's pretty amazing. She's one of the, the forgotten name in the Crick and Watson double helix, isn't she? Like so many um, Lovelace with um, thingy as well, the forgotten names. Um, I actually wrote about whole genome sequences a while ago for Culture 3. I do writing, by the way, if you need a writer. And, He's a good um, writer, really good we, writer. It was So they're talking about the whole genome project and how the original budget in the 80s was like 3 billion because there's 3 billion base pairs in the av in, in a human dna so they thought okay a buck a pair a buck a pair a dollar a pair <laughs> makes sense and now there's companies who can do whole your whole genome sequence for 200 dollars. so it's kind of progressed and once they get quantum into this I, I think that's not using quantum as well so once you get the quantum you can genome sequence everything and then how things interact with other things so yeah so you get so so you know we've mapped the genome not you and i but really smart people We've made that technology accessible and 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 cheaper to do, right? Yeah. You know, great scientists are determining the function of these genes, right? What's happening with them. And then, you know, now we need something more powerful to actually understand and decipher 
how these genes operate at the molecular level. And we talked about, you know, classical computers not being able to really do much with chemical and biological problems, right? So um, I think that's where we're headed. I'm starting to see the potential. I, I didn't really know this whole tie-in with quantum until we got into this book and started researching a little bit more and talking to, you know, folks from you know, Horizon and, you know, uh, all of those guys. But um, what do you think it's about the, Fred? Yeah, go ahead. It's a, it's a different... It's different to kind of perhaps what we've learned about what technology is for. Because if you don't work, if you're not a, a physicist or a chemist or a biologist, you don't really think about about it and how quantum can change biology and change chemistry. We're perhaps we're more used to traditional mainstream industries, um, media and shipping and computing, and not thinking about this. So yeah, thinking, looking at it, and reading it through the eyes of these chemists and what they're going to do with quantum kind of opens the realization of oh, damn this is going to change everything well yeah and 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 what he does what uh michio kaku does in in the following chapters we're you know, reading a little bit of ahead but it, it like starts to translate what that means to industry which is going to be really interesting because everyone wants to figure out well how are we going to apply this to be how's this make my business better how's it going to make yeah making cars better? How's it going to make making fertilizer better and, and all of that stuff? So I got a question for you. What do you think about Fred Hoyle's theory that he referenced in this? Do you remember running across that? Run it by me again. So <laughs> the name is kind of funny. It's called the panspermia theory. Panspermia theory, which he oh, was like- that Life comes from, me, from a meteor, right? Yeah. Or from, or from outer space and not from the planet yeah. itself. Oh, I'm all for that. Yeah. Until they prove it otherwise, that's um, that's my go-to. Yeah. Life life found a way somewhere else and it landed here on a meteorite. Yep. Well, K Kaku says you can't fully rule out that DNA came from somewhere other than this world. You can't rule it out, right? So it's like, okay, because you know, rocks and gas clouds have amino acids in them, right? Um, and Hoyle talks about well, the, the reasoning that is that, that, that it, everything popped up so damn quickly that there, there must be another explanation for where life came from. But then they throw in, oh, but you have amino acids because that guy with the, the the goo that you said, that kind of speeds everything up. So maybe you don't need to have a meteorite with life coming from somewhere else on it. Right, right. Which, which again, <laughs> sets the case for quantum. But I, I, I actually found that. I found that to be really fun and, and interesting to, to, to think about with this. Um, the last little piece is we, we keep, he keeps going back to this, this Richard Feynman concept of the path integral method, which is, you know, basically determining all possible paths, assigning a probability of those paths and that eventually turning into, you know, a version of what actually happens, right? So you're in a maze, you map out not just one way to go through the maze, but all possible ways through the maze. You assign probabilities to those, and then the wave function collapse, and you're on the other side of the phase. Um, so path integral method, uh, we, you know, he talks about a little bit, and I guess lastly, this this idea of illustrating the complexity of this. So illustrating the complexity of uh, analyzing biological systems and chemical processes. Okay, so analyzing the hydrogen hydrogen atom okay done went through difficult process but we made it happen and then moving from that to helium like is exponentially more challenging so much so that you know traditional compute can't do it so once you just move a little box over <laughs> on the periodic chart you know that illustrates the exponential complexities that we don't have the compute power to understand and on that note, I think I don't have the brain power to compute anymore. Um, I think on that note, we will call time on part two of Quantum Supremacy by Michu Kaku. And next week, we'll be talking about the, the real life business case, perhaps. Um, yeah. Thank you for being here on Book Club. We've had a great time. Jeremy, we will meet again next week. Be curious. Stay disruptive. Keep thinking on paper.